Well, thank you so much. Um, my name is Alex Lawson. I'm the Executive Director of Social Security Works. <laughs> oh, thanks. It's really a joy uh, to be in this room with all of you here. Um, you are the muscle of this movement because of our work together. We are at a place that is actually hard for me to believe uh, in the fight for guaranteeing health care for everyone in this country. Uh, and for that, I would like you all to give yourselves a large round of applause, please, because we are going to win. Because I talk to people and I haven't heard even a small diminishment in the fight. In fact, people are ready to go. People want to do more and now is the time to do it. I want to say that the danger of moments like this is not that we are going to get nothing because we have built a movement that is shaking the foundations of the establishment and they are scared of what we've built. So what they're going to do is they're going to try to substitute garbage for guaranteed health care. That is the co-op stage. That is the peril that we're facing right now. And that's why we need a shared analysis. And this strategy conference couldn't come at a better time for doing that. So it's my great pleasure to introduce someone who can really delve into why commercial insurance can never, can never be even a part of the solution when we're talking about guaranteeing health care for everyone in this country. <laughs> Diane Archer is a tireless truth teller and fighter for guaranteed health care. She founded the Medicare Rights Center in uh, 1989. She is uh, going to go through the dangers of allowing commercial insurance. Uh, we know what that looks like with Medicare Advantage, right? It's like a festering, growing thing within the system. Uh, and as, I'll keep it really brief, but one of my favorite things Diane ever said, because we spend our time a lot fighting Medicare Advantage. Um, just anything that allows the private insurance into traditional Medicare. And one time she was a little bit angry about somebody who was uh, like pushing Medicare Advantage and she said to me, I taught him everything he knows about Medicare and then he's turning around and pushing Medicare Advantage. And that fire and passion that she brings to this fight uh, is what we need. Diane Archer. Okay, good afternoon. I am thrilled and honored to be here with you to talk about Medicare for All and what we need to be aware of as we push forward. One thing we all know is it's time to fight hard for Medicare for All. It's time the public got behind a broad, bold vision for health reform that moves us to a single federal health system, treats everyone equally, and reigns in costs and recognizes the perils of keeping commercial insurance in the mix. So what are the biggest perils? The good news is, as you know, that a solid majority of Americans support expanding Medicare to guarantee coverage for everyone. And that includes nearly half of all Republicans. That's because it offers true freedom choice of doctors and hospitals anywhere in the United States with doctors and hospitals competing for patients and without insurers getting in the way. The bad news is that most people, policymakers and the general public do not understand that to expand Medicare properly, we cannot split the baby and keep insurance, commercial insurance in the mix. We need to cut the overhead and bureaucracy that commercial insurers bring with them. We need to eliminate employer coverage and the job block it creates as well. We need to bring down costs and drive long-term improvements through a single federal system. Most people, and that includes members of Congress, do not begin to understand 
key differences between social insurance and commercial insurance. If they did, they would appreciate the dangers of building on our broken healthcare system. They like the fact that Medicare regulates doctor and hospital prices. That is critical, necessary in any viable healthcare system, but it's not sufficient. The problem is not simply costs. Even if Congress decided to extend Medicare's lower prices to everyone and cut our health care costs significantly, the U.S. health system would still not be meeting our individual or collective health needs. And this is a point that's lost on a lot of smart people. We need freedom, meaning choice of doctors and hospitals anywhere in the country. We need a system that doesn't ration care. We need to promote innovation that drives system improvements. We need to end systemic bureaucratic waste and profiteering. We need an efficient system. I hope I'm sounding like a Republican. Because we need to move Republicans. And these are all values that should appeal to Republicans as much as Democrats. What makes Medicare work is that it is designed for everyone, truly one size fits all for the public good, not for profit. Automatic, guaranteed, it brings everyone together so that the cost of our care is spread across everyone. Medicare for All addresses the failings of our health care system today. It addresses the unaffordable health care costs that are killing us, figuratively as well as literally. Even with Medicare today, which needs to be improved, as long as you have supplemental coverage, big as long as, your costs are the same whether you need a lot of care or a little. You can budget for your care. You have the freedom to get the care you want wherever you need it, anywhere in America. If you're here in Minnesota at a conference, you can get care. If you're out in California visiting a parent, you can get care. If you're in Delavit, where with a friend, if you want to go to Texas to MD Anderson, you can get care. Wherever you are in this country, you can get care. That's what we need. <laughs> Medicare for all gets to the root problem with our health care system which is far more problematic than the costs. It treats everyone equally, young and old, Easterners and Westerners, rich and poor, healthy and sick, no matter where in the US you live. It guarantees us all access to needed care without the burden of high costs if we are sick. It's accountable to the public, not to shareholders. Commercial health insurance limits our freedom to see the doctors and use the hospitals we want and need. It discriminates against people who need costly care. Through narrow networks, high deductibles and co-pays, it rations care and does not look out for the long-term collective health of Americans. The commercial insurers claim much of their data is proprietary. So there's a lot we don't know about them but we all know people with insurance are dying for lack of health care. We all know people who aren't taking their medications because they cost too much, who are not going to the doctor or the emergency room because the deductible is too high, who are making choices that no one should have to make. Our challenge is that we're going to need to make Congress pass Medicare for all. We're going to need to exert enormous political pressure. We're going to need to help the many people who think they're satisfied with their commercial health insurance and who are scared of change think again. It's pretty easy to fear change if you're relatively healthy and use very little health care. It's also pretty easy to embrace change if you understand that you or someone you love is likely, eventually, to need a lot of care that may not be available to you or your loved one in a commercial health insurance system. I love this image of uh, the broken chain. Uh, it says it all. Commercial health plans are only as strong as their weakest link, 
and that link is weak. We need people to understand that these plans almost have to be in a race to the bottom, steering clear of delivering good, affordable care to people who most need it. Think about it. When was the last time you heard Aetna or United Health boast about its great cancer or stroke care? <laughs> Say, join us if you have heart disease. We want you. In New York, not a single plan on the state exchange includes Memorial Sloan Can a Kettering Cancer Center. Why not? The plans want to keep people with cancer from signing up with them. Where's the health plan that says, if you need costly care, you won't have any out-of-pocket costs? That's the one we all want. But you can't get that from a commercial health plan. The more care you need, the more you pay. It's as if they want to make sure you feel the pain financially as well as physically and mentally. <laughs> commercial health insurance doesn't work like other commercial products and services. Anyone who thinks otherwise is kidding themselves. Think about it. If the restaurant marketplace worked like the commercial health insurance marketplace, restaurants would be seeking customers who only wanted their free bread and water. Commercial health plans want you to sign up, and then they don't want you to order anything. OK, maybe they want you to use your free gym membership. But um, it's pretty clear that their coverage rules, their high deductibles and co-pays co are telling you that they want to keep you from, from getting any kind of high cost care. One similarity between the commercial health plans and the restaurants. Commercial health insurance offers you a menu. It's just in a foreign language with unintelligible prices. You have virtually no idea which doctors you'll be able to use or what you'll pay if you need care. The cynic in me says that's to make sure you have no clue what you're buying. What happens when people in commercial health plans need complex and costly care? Too often we hear the horror stories. Which commercial health plans are A-rated? Are there any? How would we know? Here's what we know. If we all got together to offer the best commercial insurance available with a robust network or no network, the best hospitals and doctors, we'd be out of business before we opened our doors. Everyone needing costly care would sign up. We couldn't spread costs across healthy and sick. We couldn't afford to deliver needed care. That's the problem with commercial insurance. It's why incremental approaches to health reform that keep commercial insurers in the mix are problematic. They put people with costly needs at risk. And what's worse, they threaten traditional Medicare. Let me explain. Medicare Advantage plans, as an alternative to traditional Medicare, are a perfect example of the dangers of commercial insurance. Their rationale was that they would drive competition, bring down Medicare costs, and give people a choice of health plans. In fact, they drive up Medicare costs, and they take away people's most important choice, seeing the doctors and hospitals they want and need anywhere in the country. Worse still, because they keep out-of-pocket costs low for people who are healthy and shift costs to people who are in poor health, they attract healthier people and leave traditional Medicare with sicker enrollees. We might think of them as corporate take advantage plans that take advantage of taxpayer dollars and undermine traditional Medicare, or fake advantage plans that disadvantage the Medicare program. Medicare Part D prescription drug coverage is another example of the dangers of relying on commercial health insurance. People get drug coverage, which is great, but through commercial insurance plans that can't rein in costs. They drive up costs, and that's keep, keeping people from getting needed medications, as well as costing taxpayers a bundle. So what have we learned from the Affordable Care Act in history? Was the ACA progress? 
Yes, if the measure is the number of people insured and the elimination of pre-existing condition exclusions. But the ACA also took us many steps back. It gave commercial insurers more business, more power. As a result, healthcare costs are even more unaffordable for many. Underinsurance is still keeping people from getting care. What did we learn? We learned that a federal law that subsidizes commercial health insurance costs only grows corporate power. And when it relies on states to implement the law, it leaves commercial health insurers largely free to operate unchecked. Most states, truly all but a handful, if that, don't have the will or the power to protect against commercial insurers. We need a federally administered healthcare system. Okay, why not Medicare Advantage for All? I'm hearing lots of people proposing it quietly now, and I think there's gonna be a big push for it. I think that is absolutely the worst proposal out there by far. It scares the hell out of me. Without traditional Medicare, Medicare Advantage plans would no longer be able to piggyback off traditional Medicare rates. Medicare Advantage for All would drive up Medicare spending since commercial plans can't control costs. Or more likely, to control healthcare spending, government would cut payments to those plans, which in turn would shift costs even more onto the people who most need care. And without traditional Medicare in the mix, as I know you know, Medicare Advantage plans would have even less reason to offer good networks because they would not be competing with traditional Medicare for enrollees. Without traditional Medicare, people with costly and complex conditions would be at greater risk of not getting the care they need in their Medicare Advantage plans. Now, at least they can switch to traditional Medicare uh, when they need costly care, as they often do. So what about the one in three people with Medicare and a Medicare Advantage plan today? Do they really like it? It's hard to believe they choose their Medicare Advantage plan because of its restricted networks or high deductibles. More likely, they have no real choice. Some employers force retirees to sign up with a Medicare Advantage plan if they want retiree health benefits. Some states force people with Medicaid and Medicare to use only a Medicare Advantage plan. And some people, many people, can't afford the costs in traditional Medicare. The upfront costs in traditional Medicare are about $3,000 more than in a Medicare Advantage plan because you need supplemental coverage. So they can save $250 a month on supplemental coverage if they join an MA plan. My bet is that few people would choose a Medicare Advantage plan if traditional Medicare were improved and expanded and did not require you to pay all that money to fill the gaps in coverage. Why not traditional Medicare for all? Well, certainly it would be a huge improvement, but its design undermines access to care still. I mean, the good news, it treats everyone equ equally, it guarantees coverage and choice of doctors anywhere in the country, but it's broken out into multiple parts. Uh, there's no catastrophic coverage cap. You need the supplemental coverage. And then, of course, there's no long-term care supports and services covered. There's no vision, hearing, or dental. So we need to improve on traditional Medicare. And that brings us to Medicare for All. Um, that speaks to our values. Health care as a right or basic need, not a commodity, freedom to choose our doctors, the security of cradle to grave coverage, affordability, bringing us all together, the efficiencies of, of one system, the ability to innovate, to, to have transparency, to see what's working and not working in our health care system, and um, equitable progressive financing. Uh, there's only one road to Medicare for all, and there are a bunch of national proposals that are, as you know, taking us off-road. Uh, the state work has been amazing. Um, I mentioned here California and Vermont, New York, um, and they are great stepping stones. They're important e 
uh, efforts, as you all know, to educate and galvanize the public. Um, it, would, it would be wonderful to have uh, you know, any state with a single payer legislation. But what about Mississippi and Louisiana and Arkansas? We saw what happened when we gave states to the right to expand Medicaid through the ACA to protect everyone. We need one program for everyone and federal law is key. Okay. So what's out there now? Uh, we have uh, Senators Merkley and Murphy offering us up the Choose Medicare Act. Okay, the good news, Democrats want another health care debate, yay. They see the problems with relying on commercial insurance and they see Medicare as a piece of the solution. But bad news. Choose Medicare Act builds on our broken state-based commercial health insurance system. What does it do? It gives people, individuals, and businesses the choice to buy into Medicare if they can afford it and they want to pay for it. And it might sound like a good choice, but no. It splits the baby. It keeps commercial insurance in the mix. It does nothing to rein in costs. It drives up costs in traditional Medicare because people who are less healthy join. It assumes that individuals and companies would benefit from the public Medicare program's strong bargaining power. But it's just as likely that it would weaken Medicare. It would gain a larger pool of people needing costly care, driving up Medicare premiums. Commercial insurers know how to cater to the healthy and steer the less healthy people to Medicare. And it's fair to assume that that's exactly what they would do to compete. Senator Murphy argues that their bill is the best path forward because it allows a way to, quote, test the idea that Americans will want a Medicare product. We already know they do. And then we have the Center for American Progress proposal, which is a new enhanced version of Medicare and Medicare uh, Advantage. And it has many limitations, and I'm going to go into them. It is a step up, though, from, from Murphy Mer Merkley. It has, it has some good fixes, beginning with an improved and expanded Medicare program. The CAP plan does guarantee cr cradle-to-grave coverage for all, and it doesn't rely on states to oversee the system. But even as it creates the stronger Medicare plan, which they call Medicare Extra, it threatens Medicare. It creates a stronger Medicare Advantage option with all its issues and lets people keep the commercial coverage they have if they like it. CAP attempts to level the playing field. They do understand that the commercial insurers are gaming the system every which way they can, and that's a noble effort. But as I think we all know, it's a Sisyphusian task. And likely, the plan's Achilles heel. Commercial health insurers have always been able to outmaneuver the federal government. And let's not negotiate against ourselves. So that gets us to Medicare for all. Yay! All right. And we have the Sanders Medicare for All Act and H.R. 676, bold visions. They end commercial insurance. They're efficient, effective. You know it all. Doctors and hospitals competing for patients in a free market with less waste and bureaucracy. Lots of great stuff. Um, obviously, the Sanders plan is still missing long-term care supports and services. We need that. We have that in H.R. 676. But they're strong, and they speak to our values, freedom, security, unity, efficiency, equity. As it turns out, the original GOP arguments against government-sponsored health care have proven to be the strongest arguments against commercial health insurance. What they said when there was talk about expanding Medicare back when is, quote, it's crushing cost, wasteful inefficiency, bureaucratic dead weight, and debased standards of medical care. And that is what's wrong with commercial insurance, and that's why we need Medicare for all. We've been working hard, and we've made some great progress. The organizing is working. The stage is set. 
Medicare for all is in the air. Onward! <laughs> Thank you so much, Diane. That was really a comprehensive uh, presentation. And I have to say, thanks to everybody's discipline, including all of you, we are almost, not quite, but almost on time. And we have a few minutes here to take some questions. So raise your hands, and we'll try to move through the crowd. I'm going to start. Whoever gets to the person first, Ben, why don't you go? Oh, my name's Pam Bronemeyer, and I'm a physician from the Metro East of St. Louis, and I turned 65 in January. And I will tell you, I mean, they're, they're saying now baby boomers are going towards Medicare Advantage because they're used to, they like what, they, they see those plans sort of like what their employers do. But the problem is they hound you, and they lie to you. I mean, I signed up for conventional Medicare, and I signed up for a supplemental all before January 1st, but they're still calling me. And when you ask who's calling you, you'll say, are you the government? Oh, no, we're not the government. But most people don't know how to ask or what to ask for. I'm a doctor. And I mean, I, they're hounding me now. So what happens is they do, they do unfair marketing in addition to, I mean, and with the, giving you the perks. But they just lie to people on the phone. And they I, get away with it. And they get away. Yeah, I, get, I mean, unless you say no. Medicare called me. When I called up and said I want to sign up for conventional Medicare, they gave me a time, a date, and they called me that time and that date, and everything was done. So I mean, I just think we need to call them out as the liars they are. We do. <clears throat> okay. Diane. Yes. Hi, Rachel Hi. Degolia from UCAN Universal Healthcare Action Network. So while this campaign is gathering momentum and steam and moving forward, there are also a lot of really important efforts to expand access to health care for people, particularly at the state level. I wonder what you think about efforts like in New Mexico for Medicaid buy-in. Do you know much about it? I know nothing about it. OK. <laughs> Hi. So I'm Noah, I'm from Pennsylvania, I'm a strategist from Pennsylvania. Uh, thanks for your remarks, thanks for the comprehensive overview. Um, we have mass support for Medicare for All, but we really haven't started the fight yet with the mass opposition. Um, there's a lot of players in the opposition. You mentioned the GOP, um, there's commercial insurers, there are consolidated medical groups in Pennsylvania. We have Geisinger and UPMC who are both offering medical services and insurance, HR yeah. plans. Um, there are also new players of the space, CVS acquiring Aetna, and then even things like the Bezos, Buffett, JP Morgan venture. So there's a lot of opposition, and I'm curious, which do you think are the ones to be most threatened of, and what direction will they go? What compromise will they make when the majority of American people are looking for a solution? I think we have to be... A worried about all of them, and I don't think they're going to be ready to make any compromises anytime, too, anytime soon, right? We're going to have to push super hard for what makes sense and what's fair and what we know the majority of Americans believe. There's no, there's no way the medical industrial com complex is going to back down quickly or even over time, they're going to, to the last minute, they're going to be fighting and giving tons of money to members of Congress to support their causes. I mean, we saw what happened with President Obama and prescription drugs. They're not backing down. Ken? Well, <clears throat> I just want to tell you a little story about Medicare disadvantage. <laughs> You know, these are all the good reasons that people, that it's bad, okay? But I want to tell you the moral reason. The Medicare Advantage plans actively seek people to die, okay? My father was in a traumatic accident, fractured pelvis, internal injuries, had a Medicare Advantage plan, had to be sent to the tertiary care center to Loma Linda in Southern California, a great hospital, saved his life. After two weeks in the ICU, when the doctor said it was time for him to leave the ICU, 
The Medicare Advantage plan said, oh, we're going to transfer him to our rehab facility, which was a horrible nursing home. Fortunately, we had myself an RN, my brother an RN, my sister-in-law an RN, and we knew that they weren't going to do that. And we fought them and we beat them. But most people would have just gone and they would have, he would have died there because he was too old. He, you know, talk about death panels, they got him. So um, I, I've been coming to these conferences off and on since I forget if it's 2010 or 2011 in Philadelphia. And every back then and today, I'm still hearing a same tension about whether the state level approach is in effect an incremental step. And you know, I understand the issues about the unity, but. Uh, at the same time, Healthcare for All Oregon kind of swerved too much the other way, perhaps, where we just felt like the federal level, you know, wasn't going to be possible for a long, long time, and that states moving could shake that up. And, you know, turns out Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump in combination could shake it up, too. Uh, but but I do, I, I do want to say that I feel like we need to grapple with this because, you know, I, the fellow from uh, DSA, that would, which I belong to, was, fo you know, one of those five criteria was single national unified system. And yet, I know that the DSA chapters in California are behind 562. Um, uh, Cal you know, the Cal nurses, National Nurses United have always been for national Medicare, and yet they are also for the state bill. Um, so how do we square the circle about this? How do we, yeah, I. Yeah. I think it's a great question. I think it's actually easy. I think everything you're doing at the state level is really important because it's educating people, it's galvanizing people, it's helping people at the local level understand the value of single payer. And that's critically important both at the state level and for the federal ultimate victory. So I think it's really great and you should keep doing it and we should keep fighting at the federal level as well. But as you say right now, the federal work is, is harder because of the challenges of Congress and our president. Okay, over here. Hi, Martha Livingston from uh, PNHP New York Metro and um, the labor campaign for single payer. I've been working on this forever and I wanna make a point tying what Diane's presentation has done and what Michael Lighty's presentation did. Michael made this, the extraordinarily important point that we're for health care for all, that's a great thing, but we're also for health for all, we are also for housing for all, we are also for getting rid of health disparities for all, doing everything we have to do to make this country and this world a safe and peaceful place for people to live. Why am I mentioning all this right now? Because I want to remind people that what we keep hearing is, oh, this is the ultimate goal, but we have to take steps along the way. No, it isn't. This is an incremental step forward on the path to health, justice, and a just world. Nothing more. And the only reason we don't have it is that it will take down a sixth of the economy and they are not gonna let us get that real, fa you know, without a real fight. So just keep our eyes on the prize, folks. This is not some pie in the sky radical idea. Let's join the 20th century and get healthcare for all. Two more. Uh, two short statements. Uh, we need to educate people, and the two short statements that I use is I explain to people uh, what medical loss ratio means. Our care is a loss to the insurance companies, and that infuriates people when they realize that. The second statement 
is that it's okay, it's a good thing to earn a living working with the sick and disabled people. It's not okay to make a profit from their suffering, and that's what the private insurance companies do. Uh, just, just a comment and a question. Uh, did you get a chance to mention coinsurance? Because that's the other sneak preview for Medicare Advantage plans. You enter those plans, and then in the small print somewhere, they're saying coinsurance, and you think, oh, I've got another insurance plan somewhere. And it turns out that those add up to about 20% of certain costs that you may incur. And if you're going through something like chemotherapy, or you have to have repeat MRIs or anything like that, it will bankrupt you because you have to pay 20% of whatever that facility is, is charging. So that was one thing. And the second thing is, very briefly, this question of choice. In certain areas, certainly where I am in metro Atlanta, Georgia, there's a, the delivery system is very monopolized. Right, so you, you don't really have that much choice anymore, even in terms of a traditional Medicare system. And the last thing is, if you go with an Advantage plan, you're going into a private system. Where is the accountability? And that's what's so critical about our relationship with the government and Medicare. Uh, excellent points. On the Medicare Advantage uh, point, you should know, anybody who gets really sick in a Medicare Advantage plan can have to pay in network $6,700 each calendar year out of pocket, which means if you get sick in December, you could be paying out of pocket close to $14,000 between December and January, which is ridiculous. And that's what keeps people from getting care. In terms of accountability, I do want to share one of my favorite stories of the last couple of months. I was at a, a meeting where George Halverson was speaking and he was talking about the benefits of Medicare Advantage for all. And I pulled him aside at the end and I said, you know, my understanding is that at Kaiser you're learning all kinds of important things about medical devices that work and ones that kill people and about medical protocols that work and ones that um, kill people and you don't share any of that. And a, a good public health system, we learn from what's broken and we help make sure that other people aren't harmed from it. And he said, I agree, that's a problem. <laughs> so that's the accountability we have from the uh, commercial health insurance system. It's, it's absolutely unacceptable. Please thank Diane Archer for her wonderful presentation. <laughs>